Hello, and welcome to SETI Live. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, communication specialist here at the SETI Institute. Today, I am super, super excited to be joined by Kelly and Zach Wienersmith, who you may know from uh, Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal, to talk about their latest book, A City on Mars, which is only mildly blue screening, so yay. Uh, and uh, I, I, this is really cool. So what we're talking about today is, should we settle on another world? Can we? <laughs> um, I, and if you're if you're hoping that this is going to be a yes, we should, you're in the wrong place because uh, no, no, this this is not one of those stories. So first off, uh, thank you, Kelly and Zach, for joining us today. I'm glad you could both be here. Thanks for having welcome us. In. And uh, welcome in to all of our viewers from around the world. Please let us know where you are watching from and welcome into our listeners of the podcast version of SETI Live available on most podcast platforms. Thank you for being here. Uh, so. A city on Mars. Um, it's it's smart. It's funny, um, but it's not exactly the yeah we should go settle on Mars kind of book that I think maybe uh, people were hoping that it would be. So how let's start at the beginning. How did this how did this book come about? Like what what was the impetus for it? Well, so we also were hoping it was going to be a yay space settlements book. <laughs> so we we wrote another book together called Soonish. And two of the chapters were about space. So one was about how the cost of launching stuff to space is going down rapidly. And the other was about how asteroid mining might provide resources for building settlements in space. And between mm -hmm. those chapters and all the things that you hear space settlement advocates say, we thought, oh, wow, we've been reading about this in sci-fi for like decades, generations. It's going to happen in the next like 10 years in our lifetimes. Let's write the guide to what the next decade is going to be like for space settlement. And the more research we did, the more we were like, oh, we don't know this yet. We don't know that yet. And oh, man, that's scary. And you know, we, maybe international law is going to stop this all. And anyway, by the end of the book, it was about how we still hope it happens eventually because it still sounds cool to us. But we don't right. we're not optimistic that it's going to happen in our lifetimes anymore. So uh, let's. So you this came about kind of because of the previous book. Um, how many people do you feel like you talked to in the research of, of a city on Mars? Uh, it was a long project. It was a, <laughs> yeah, so we, we have 27 shelves in our bookcases that are books that we read over the four years together. Yeah. And then, you know, there were papers and we did do interviews and I went to, you know, IAC, Human to Mars Summit, uh, National Space or National Space Society working groups. So probably hundreds yeah. when you include everybody at conferences and stuff. And then we also had experts read our chapters before they went in the book to try to make sure that we were getting stuff right. Um, we paid some lawyers to go over yes. it. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was a whole thing. Wow. Um, so what what was the most surprising thing that you you learned in the process? I, I mean, it's a pretty, I'm gonna, I'm gonna warn everybody, this is not a thin little book. No. This is, this has got some heft to it. Um, so I, asking you for a surprising thing may be, may be a little difficult, but what was a surprising thing that you learned from it? I would say almost every chapter, there was something that was a little surprising. So one thing, and this is the right audience for it because it's kind of nerdy, is that the moon is carbon poor, which just blew my mind because you're just like, if, if people are seriously talking about the idea of, of like a permanent or semi-permanent human settlement on the moon, you know, humans are 20% carbon. It's a problem, you know, and so it's it's not like, you know, sometimes you come across articles where the headline, the articles are usually a little better, but the headline will say something like, oh, you can grow plants in moon soil. And it's like, well, no, you can't. The plants literally can't make themselves, you know. You can grow plants if you have an atmosphere and water and nutrients and sunlight, which is true of almost any substance. Uh, <laughs> so so that was, that was for us, or at least for me, that was a big like, why is this not front and center in other books about, about uh, the moon? And, uh, you know. Yeah. Kelly, how about you? Anything that that sort of stood out for you? It, the the carbon was one of the first moments where I'm like, oh man, there's a lot that I hadn't realized that was going to be a challenge. And then finding out that there's perchlorates, which are endocrine disruptors, in the regolith on Mars was another like, mm. oh, that's that's a problem. And of course, the people, the advocates that we spoke to were like, well, it's not really a problem because it's water soluble. So you just rinse the soil <laughs> and then you're done. And, but, you know, like we bought a farm and if somebody was like, there's endocrine disrupting things <laughs> in your soil, but just like rinse it a lot and then grow the plant you're going to feed your kid. I wouldn't, I'd buy 
farm somewhere else. Like I just, I don't want to take that chance. And so that was surprising. And then also how little we know uh, about space medicine after, you know, the decades we've spent with yeah. space stations, how little of the medical information that we know will be relevant to life on the moon or Mars uh, was surprising to me as well. Yeah. Uh, on that front, uh, one of the things that, that I kind of caught my attention when I was reading the blurb on the side is the whole thing about, can you make babies in space? Um, so this has been sort of one of those topics that comes up again and again, and, and astronauts always sort of hem and haw about, you know, the discussion of, of sex in space. Did you have any more luck having that, that discussion with anybody at all? Or did you get the same sort of, doesn't happen, we don't know anything? So the, the main source of information for that is we we read a non-trivial portion of all like space memoirs ever written. Like we really scoured for stuff. And, and when you do that, you do find it peeking around the corners. I mean, I think astronauts, except for Tyra ones, reasonably don't want to talk about this because they would like to stay on flight. And, you know, agency heads certainly don't want to get brought before Congress to explain why they're talking about why we need more sex research for space. That doesn't sound like it would go well. Um <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, I, I mean, but, but, you know, a great source was um, one of the best books ever written on space was Mary Roach's Packing for Mars, where she actually got some mm -hmm. cosmonauts, some whiskey, I believe it was, and uh, got, got them to spill a little. Uh, so, so we did find some sources for claims. Uh, that, that's, for solo rides. For solo. Uh, I don't know what we're allowed <laughs> to say on this. Uh, show. Yeah. <laughs> but uh Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. It is. It is a family friendly show, so I totally yeah, understand. Yeah. We'll stop there. Yes. But yeah. but the, it does kind of bring back the question: like, can you make babies in space? Can we populate another planet? I mean, we've seen some science fiction that sort of lends itself to that. Of you know, there are issues and differences, but you know, is this a thing that anybody's really working on? So there are sporadic experiments that are sent up on different animals using different vehicles for different lengths of time. Yeah. There's nothing that's really been, there's no plan to address this question directly where you're, for example, putting a rodent colony in space and following them across generations. Uh, right. And you know, to really understand this question, we'd probably want something like a research station on the moon. So on the International Space Station, you're protected by the magnetosphere so you don't get all the radiation that space has to offer. And you're also in free fall. So you're essentially experiencing, you know, your bones are essentially experiencing something like no gravity, whereas mm -hmm. the moon and Mars have partial gravity. And so a lot of the problems you have with bone loss and muscle loss might be much less of a problem on the moon or Mars. But we don't we don't know if, you know, the longest person in space has been in space for like 437 days. And right. we know you can recover from that. Mm -hmm. But if you're born and you go through all of your development on the moon or Mars, is that particularly bad for your bones or something, which, you know, evolved in an environment where you've got Earth gravity? Uh, so mm -hmm. there's there's a lot we don't know about long-term impacts of radiation and microgravity. And, well, and yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, we also don't know, you know, often in this conversation, we say, like, can you have a baby? But actually, you know, that baby, if you want to have a settlement, has to grow up to be an adult who can also have babies. So, the, you know, you have to go through the entire process of development, uh, which we really, really know nothing about. You know, everyone who's been to space has been a fully uh, developed adult human. Most of them have been men. So, like, the amount of data we have on a question like this is just, like, almost nothing. Uh, and then when you add that, you know, it's not as if NASA has some kind of systematic program. You know, the experiments in space are, like, what you can get. Uh, you know, there have been like a 40 year, can you make babies in space program? Maybe we know a little more now. Um, and, and, and that tees up the big problem, which was if, if starting tomorrow, tomorrow, you had $10 billion a year to answer the question, it would still take decades to do ethically. Right. It'll take decades to do unethically. Um, <laughs> so, so, and, and nobody's doing it. There is a little money, you know, April Ronka is, is a scholar at, at NASA, right? Uh, working. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're working on this stuff, but it's not like there's like massive agency funding. It's certainly not like the the very rich people who have rocket companies are spending on it. And I, I think one of the, there were a couple disappointing moments while doing research. Like, you mm -hmm. know, you don't get disappointed when you discover no one's had a chance yet to answer this question. But, but I did get disappointed when we would talk to people about the things we don't know yet. And their response would be, well, look, we're just, we're going to, some things you can't know ahead of time. So we're just going to go. And some kids are going to die, but like, we'll figure <laughs> it out. We'll leave electoral selection run worse. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like I, <laughs> I know that you can't learn everything before you go to Mars. There's gonna be surprises, but there's a lot more we could learn yeah. by like research stations on the moon <laughs> before you go. There's a lot of right. you know, certainty that yeah. you could 
and and to that point, like if like if like there was an asteroid headed right for Earth and we had to leave very soon, then you could make sort of justifications for borderline unethical stuff. But there is no rush, right, to do this. So like, why? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so on that on that order, I'm going to welcome some people in, but I'm I'm going to follow up on a question on that one. So let me just say hi to some people. So uh, welcome in. We have people watching from New Jersey, um, the Netherlands, Canada. California, um, Finland, Pakistan, welcome in. Uh, Philippines, uh, Germany, more California. I know it's a very odd time of day for a lot of our viewers. So thank you for, for being here. Um, thank you for watching. And of course, you know, welcome to everybody on all of the different platforms. So thank you for being being in our audience today. Uh, so on that, that thought of, you know, we're, we don't have an asteroid coming. There's no sense of urgency to it. Does it feel like with the the ongoing situations in the world and the, you know, I'm, I'm just going to do the hand wavy everything. Um, does it feel like there is a little bit of a sense of urgency right now? Or does it still sort of feel like as you talk to people that, eh, no, it's really it's really not at the forefront of of the majority of the researchers minds. Uh, oh, go ahead. I, I would say it depends on who you're talking to. Um, I, I would think if you've got like kind of a, you know, so in all this stuff, when we try to talk about what people are saying, it's, it's not like there's survey data. All we can do is like read books and talk to people and try to guess. Um, mm -hmm. There is, let's say, a section of the community that believes this stuff is urgent and it's what's going to save us from, you know, various uh, near term calamities. Um, and we can kind of go down the line on that. But the, the basic conclusion we came to is the answer is no. It's It's just like not even really feasible. Um, and if you were going to spend a dollar on mitigating existential risk to humans, there are a lot of better places to stuff a dollar right now. But the defense folks and the, the yes. bunch of politicians do feel like there's a sense of urgency because we want to, for example, you know, get back, get boots back on the moon and we set up research stations and stuff before China does. Yeah. And so, you know, there are some folks who are arguing that a new space race with China has already started. And so we don't want to fall behind. So that community does feel a sense of urgency. Yes, um, yes or at least they're aware that additional funding is tied to a sense of urgency. Uh, that, that's right. You, you talk about that early on in the in the introduction about um, how the the different versions of a space race, right? So the what happened in the fifties and sixties and what's sort of happening now are very different from each other. So can you sort of like? let everybody else in on on what those differences are because i thought that was really a fascinating take on it sure so in the first space race where we were racing with the soviet union the deal was we just wanted to get the first set of boots on the moon and so you know you'd sort of land touch it say me first and then go home <laughs> and so you know the soviets could have landed in the exact same spot after us and you know us having been there beforehand wouldn't keep them from visiting it subsequently but now with this new race with China, we're talking about, you know, thinking about settlements or research stations or turning the small amount of water on the moon into propellant where you'd start gas stations where rockets can take off and go to the next place. And so the sense of ur there's a much greater sense of urgency to get there first because the spots of the moon that are good for mm -hmm. our purposes, not for science, but, but for human purposes are much smaller. So, you know, for example, you know, the moon has two earth weeks worth of night. And so mm -hmm. if you're depending on solar panels, that's going to be really tough. But if you go to the poles where you've got craters and the peaks of eternal light or the peaks of almost eternal light, you can get solar panels up on stilts there that get you sunlight something like 90% of the time. So that's great. And then inside of those craters is, and again, I'm sure your audience knows this, but inside of those craters is the only place where you can easily get, you know, ice or water in the form of very hard ice. There's small mm -hmm. amounts of water in the regolith, but concrete is wetter than the regolith uh, at the equator. So if you really want water, you're going to need to go to the poles to get it. And so right. it's very it's very clear where we're going to go. And I think the peaks of eternal light are something like one one hundredth of a billionth of the lunar surface. And so, you know, one company or one country could pretty easily set up shop in all of the best places and exclude, you know, if the U.S. got there first, for example, we could exclude China from going there. And so whereas the first race was just, you know, you go, you visit, but someone else can do the same thing after you. If we go and we visit and we stay there, then we are making it so that a, a limited resource is not available to somebody else. And international law is not really clear about what you're allowed to do up there, which complicates matters more. 
Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that. So that is one of the things that sort of gets in the way is is the the international law. But you said you had lawyers look over the books. Um, what what was what did you find out about how international law works when it comes to uh, space exploration? There, there's a lot. No, I, I will try to unpack what's necessary quickly. This is a big part of the book. Um, but so first of all, uh, it, it exists. Uh, a lot of people are either unaware that there's space law or believe it will sort of uh, you know, uh, generously disappear when we are ready to go start doing stuff. When Americans in particular. When Americans right? in yeah. particular, yes. So um, the governing document is the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. It has a lot of stuff in it. For the purpose of settlement, the major thing to know is Article 2, which says you can't claim sovereignty, you being a country. Sovereignty just means like what you think of as a nation state. So meaning like the U.S. can't declare the moon a new U.S. state, even if Newt Gingrich wants us to. Uh, and, um, nor can like, you know, uh, I don't know, Russia claim that it's part of the moon is part of Russia. You can't do it, nor can you, you know, claim on behalf of a corporation. You just can't do it. There are not sovereign countries in space. Um, however, uh, it's not clear what you can do with stuff in space. So, right. So you can't claim to own the territory of the moon, but you could maybe use its resources all you want. And that is in particular the U.S. interpretation under law that was passed during the Obama administration, under an executive order that was made during the Trump administration, um, and embodied in the Artemis Accords, a, a document recently uh, put out by the U.S., but agreed to by a lot of major nations, you know, Germany, the United Kingdom, Israel, I think Australia, um, 20 nations total, I believe now. So you have this world where uh, you can't claim sovereignty, but you can maybe use as much resource wise as you want. And you can also under the Artemis Accord set up what's called a safety zone, which is not a claim of sovereignty, but is a, it is a claim of you need to be careful landing here because it's kind of part of our research entity, which is a totally reasonable thing for scientific reasons. You don't need people firing, you know, high speed regolith at you when they land next to your base. Totally. But it is a sort of quasi turf like claim, which goes back to what Kelly was talking about, about how a, how a like 2020 space race could be characteristically different. Um, from the one in the 60s. Right. So this is, uh, again, as you pointed out, it's it's not like, oh, we got here first and now you got here behind us and it's all cool. This is this is mine and this is mine and this is mine and you can't have any of this. I mean, I don't I don't own it, but it's mine. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Right. And, and, and what's especially crucial there, I think. So we don't believe there's anything of economic value on the moon. Like in the right. sense of profit, right? There's, there's absolutely scientific value. You could make money doing like services for governments that want to be there. But what matters is that space is totemic for nations. It is how a way we declare power to each other. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that, that is why you would feel a visceral feeling if you found out tomorrow, if, if, if Vladimir Putin declared there was a base on the poles that was Russian and nobody was allowed to come but Russians, you would have a visceral feeling you wouldn't have if there was a base uh, on the seabed. Um, because because space is just part of our way of thinking about which country is the most powerful. So 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 even though you you know we think there's nothing of, of major value, you could still get an escalation in tensions uh, because of this turf stuff in space. That is that is a little frightening to think about. Um, yeah, I had a, I had a gut reaction there myself. Um, okay. I'm going to welcome in some more people. Um, we've got people watching from Scotland, Cyprus, Iowa, France, Guatemala, uh, England, Serbia, Greece. Um, anything else? Let's see. Texas. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And, and you know, feel free to um, ask questions. Um, I will do my best to get to them. And uh, we will we will continue talking here with with Kelly and Zach. So, um Kelly, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious about something for for both of you, really, because uh, you you have kids and working on these kinds of projects does take a lot of time. What were some of the adjustments that the two of you had to make in order for this to work? Uh, you know, I I have to work around my own teenager and my husband and I are, you know, a lot of the time it's I you get you have to go to that meeting. I can't. So, you know, Working on a massive book, that sounds like something where there was a lot of adjustments that had to be made. So how did the two of you work that? Well, our editor made a big adjustment <laughs> in our deadline. <laughs> and that was that was a that was a big part of it. Cause so that this was a four-year project, which means it completely overlapped in, you know, the start of COVID. You know, I know COVID's not done, COVID will never be done, but like the you know, the worst of COVID pre-vaccine COVID. Um, mm -hmm. and so 
we had to figure out like a different work schedule because we were both working from home. And so I'd work for three hours, then he'd work for three hours, then I'd work for three hours, then he'd work for three hours. And we would read, you know, take notes for all of that time. And then we would try to go on walks, like try to drag the kids along on walks while we would talk about what we had learned. Our daughter is so tired of space <laughs> law. I offered to go talk to her fourth grade class about like space and stuff. And she was like, Mm. I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm cool. I know you're going to try to talk yourself. about space law and I don't want to hear about it anymore. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think we just, you, you try to respect that each of that both of us are under a lot of stress because life was sort of out of control at that point. Yeah. But it did, um, it did, you know, one, one, one of the upsides of working on the same project is that now and then there was a time where it was like, it was clear that what had to happen is one of us needed to work solid for four days to get something across the finish line. And so, you know, the other one would just be like, I'm in charge of kids. I will see you in four days. And uh, and it was, it, you know, I feel like if, if we're not both of our project, that would be a tougher ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Don't fall behind, four days behind on your work. Yeah. So I think there was like a week where it was like, all right, Zach, you do all the work or all the art. Yes, and I'm that's watching right. the kids. And then it was like maybe a month where it was fact like, checking. I, I went through every single line and found the facts that went through every, for every line in that 400 the page book, the yeah. citation. So we have a version of the book that has line citations. Uh, so that was Zach being like, I guess I don't get to work for a month. So he, <laughs> he would do his comics. Like we'd all be yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. bed at night and he would be up at night drawing his dirty jokes and, uh, <laughs> by Family candlelight friendly. and uh yeah, but, yeah. Candlelight, yeah. In, in my, I my yeah. that's right uh, yeah it was I, hard. I mean fantastic job i you know obviously that is that is a massive undertaking even without family complications and covid complications so yeah. i mean the fact that the fact that you accomplished this in four years honestly is kind of impressive uh, let's be honest there is there's a lot in here um i'm gonna be honest and say everybody i haven't made it all the way through it yet because it is it is really good and i didn't want to like race so um yeah but thanks you guys read this book <laughs> Um, all right, we are getting some questions. So I want to, and some of them are about the book itself. So I want to kind of uh, get these through here. Um, will City on Mars also be available in any other languages? Is there anything planned in that direction? Yes, uh, there'll be, I'm, I'm guessing that's a German name. There will be a German edition out. Um, there'll be a there, Spanish, German, Chinese. I think there's another Taiwanese version Ooh, I, yeah the, yes the, there the, are the, no, number oh uh oh gosh i'm gonna i the answer is yes i'm sorry <laughs> i don't have a, a list but there are a number of languages if, if you if you want to email us we can we can check on on what specific language you'd like it to be in but yes but you know what stinks i learned <laughs> russian uh while writing this book because i really was this was before the war started and i wanted to go to the museum in moscow and like and so I learned Russian thinking, oh, there might, maybe there'll be a like Russian leg of the book tour. And no, I, and obviously not, I understand that this so is much. very, very low on the list of tragedies <laughs> as a result of this war. But, uh, but anyway, shouldn't have spent time learning Russian. I, I understand. I was, I was in high school when I started Russian and, uh, the cold war was wrapping up and I was very excited. And then, um, my my father pointed out that he worked for a defense contractor and that he had top secret clearance and uh yeah no no trip to moscow for me so yeah. um he finally he also spoke russian he had learned it uh in the air force don't ask and and finally got to go and i have to say that he was giddy for like a week after he went <laughs> so yeah <laughs> it was oh, it was I adorable so him. Yeah, I, I, I am with Strelka, you. Taxidermied. You could still see Belka and Strelka, <laughs> the first animals to or dogs to orbit the moon and return. Yeah, or, no, exactly. Return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Zapfan Zapfan is asking if there is an audiobook version, or will there be? Uh, Audible.com. Uh, assuming right. you're in the U.S., I don't know what the arrangement is uh, outside the U.S. But uh, and we read the Nota Bene, so you yes, can we, hear we a little, little bit more from us. But then there's a professional reading the rest of it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So not, not read by you two. All right. Little bits are read by us. The, the, the most stupid part of the book is read by us. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tampa Anna uh, Maria is asking, why is there nothing of value on the moon? So can you kind of clarify so, 
that let, let me clarify that what I what I said was nothing of economic value in the sense that you could invest in a company uh, and generate value and get more money back to shareholders, that kind of value. There's, there's obviously valuable stuff to do on the moon. Uh, if I were going to pick my dream mission for the whole solar system, it would be a little robot to go in the lava tubes on the moon. Like I, I, so I, I don't want to like be giving off any sort of vibes of why bother with the moon? The moon is amazing. And actually, I would say underfunded. There's a great book by Paul Spudis, like ranting about how Mars gets so much money, but there's all this stuff we don't know about the moon. Um, that said, um, there's a great quote. There's a scientist named Michel Van Pelt. And this was not that long. This was like 2017. Uh, I don't think the economics have changed. He said, if there were bars of gold on the surface of the moon, it would not be worth it to go get them, right? Um, so uh, claims that are, so to say the obvious, there are no, no bars of gold on the moon. A more common claim is helium three. Perhaps mm -hmm. uh, some of uh, your listeners are thinking that's what we're going to get. We have a whole section. We had to cut it down from a longer section. Our editor was like, you cannot keep going on about helium three. But we do cite a great paper that basically says, look, it's not economically valuable already. And by the way, you can make it on Earth uh, as a byproduct of heavy water reactors, which are already a thing we know how to build. And there are many operating. So. And, and then beyond that, I don't think there are any serious claims. There are claims that you could like launch rockets from the moon, but then the rockets have to go somewhere economically valuable. And that's often sort of skipped, you know, like where are they going to go where the big right. money is? Um, Why is it not worth getting bars of gold on the moon? Why, oh, oh, sure. Uh, well, just, you know, so you think about a Saturn V <laughs> rocket, right? This giant skyscraper propellant. I forget, the, some nerd out there knows the answer, but it's some small number of tons were able to even get to the surface of the moon. And then when you mm -hmm. added what was actually boosted from the surface, I don't even know, it might be in the single digits of tons. Um, it's not much. Um, so you try to imagine, you know, how much you, you could bring home for, for the cost of having a skyscraper full of propellant boost the moon, not to mention like, mission control and all the trained professionals involved. It's 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 just not serious. And then one other thing we talk about, and I wish we were talking to a developmental economist uh, named Charles Kenny who pointed out this thing that kind of blew our minds, which was there was a report out from the World Bank and they do these measurements of total human wealth. I think the number was something like 90, only about two and a half percent of all human wealth is in natural resources. People tend to think the number is much higher. And of that two and a half percent, 90 percent of that is fossil fuels, which unless something very surprising is in the moon's past, there are no fossil fuels on the moon. So it just, you know, human wealth is in ideas and technology, not in mineral resources. Um, so that's my whole rant. We do have a lot more detail in the book. <laughs> all right. Well, there you go. So um, if you want to know more about that. Um, uh, Alan Gross is asking, uh, if you can tell us some more about, uh, radiation and coping with it. And I know that this is also a topic in the book. So. Yeah. So the astronauts aboard the international space station and all the other space stations that came before are protected by the magnetosphere. And so the kinds of radiation that you get from the sun or galactic cosmic radiation, uh, you're not getting exposed to a lot of that on the International Space Station because you're protected by the magnetosphere. And so we don't actually know a lot about great space radiation's impacts on the human body. So when you go to a place like the moon or Mars, which don't have a magnetosphere that's like ours, uh, then you're going to get exposed to all of that. And so a lot of the proposals that we've seen include things like burying your habitat in meters of regolith so that you have essentially a shield to capture the radiation before it gets you. But this stuff is so counterintuitive, you know, like if your habitat is built the wrong way and you don't have enough regolith, then when the radiation hits the top of your habitat, it undergoes spallation, which means it breaks into other kinds of radiation. Sometimes they're even more dangerous than the radiation you started with. And so there's a lot that we have to learn. And there are ways to shield yourself from radiation, but a lot of them are less beautiful than what you might imagine, you know, covering yourself in dirt didn't, you know, we're moving to Mars to become like ants or something. You know, I had imagined that it was going to be these beautiful glass domes, but uh, Brent Sherwood wrote a great book about space architecture and noted that, you know, those glass domes, those people would be baking in radiation. And so that's probably not what it's going to look like when we move to space. Yeah. Um, and, then, and, oh, and, and there was a quote in this review that we really loved where I said, I think it was Jeffrey Chancellor, where he essentially says, you know, we don't actually know that space radiation causes cancer, but it's reasonable to assume that it does. And so like, that's where we are with space radiation. Yeah. Like, probably causes cancer, <laughs> but we don't have a lot of data. But uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory re recently got a new uh, device that can help simulate galactic cosmic radiation. So we should have better soon, but it's complicated. Yeah. The, the one thing I want to add to that is like, unless you happen to be caught in the beam of like a, a blast from the 
which, which could give you radiation poisoning. What we're really talking about is like changes in the rates of cancer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and possibly there could be other effects, like there might be like cognitive effects we don't know. Reproductive. Re yeah, and so that comes back to reproduction. So if it's like, well, may maybe if you send a 50 year old, it's worth it because they can live their remaining say 30, 40 years without a, a serious risk of premature death. But if you try to imagine a settlement where you have like a person who's born there, it's much scarier. Um, no, and not to mention, right. of course, you know, if, if they're someone who, uh, a female, then they have all their gametes at the beginning. And so that could have weird, like, are they not allowed out of the, the hole? That seems like a not great way to run a society, but yeah. So, so becoming mole people on Mars, probably not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> this is why the space people don't invite us to their parties anymore, <laughs> but I promise we're fun we're, yeah, we're hilarious. in other ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kelly and Zach, we are, we are at the end of our half an hour and it has been, a, it has been a delight and I'm looking forward to finishing the book because this is, this is a really good one. So if you, if you can get your hands on it, which it's available pretty much everywhere, I highly recommend. And if I ever run into these two, I am getting them to autograph this with something hilarious. <laughs> Um, and, uh, of course, as, as was said, it is available, uh, in audiobook form on audible.com. So feel free to go check that out and coming soon to a foreign language near you. Um, Kelly, Zach, thank you for taking uh, time out of your understandably busy day to be here this morning. And, uh, I, I really do appreciate that you made the time. Thank you oh, so much. So we much. really appreciate you asking us to be here. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you again for coming in, joining us and watching. Uh, make sure you check out uh, Kelly and Zach's books. And uh, of course, um, go find them both on social media and uh, check out Zach's Saturday morning breakfast cereal. If you're not already a fan, like most of us probably are at this point, my husband still loves to read them to me every so often. So, um, and uh, everybody will be back next week and uh, Franck Marchis will be our host and he will be talking to a scientist about Ganymede and uh, finding um, organics and salts on that particular moon. So very exciting news. And uh, we will see you all then. Have a fabulous rest of the week, everybody. Again, Kelly and Zach, thank you so much.